Дорогие коллеги и друзья, от лица журнала «Новое литературное обозрение» я приветствую вас на наших 27-х банных чтениях. Поскольку в этом году мы проводим эти чтения в онлайн, уже на прошлой неделе, в субботу-воскресенье, было первые две секции, сегодня мы открываем третью секцию. Название нашей конференции «Антропология насилия. Государство». Общество и культура. И в прошлый раз, то есть в прошлую субботу и воскресенье, мы обсуждали проблематику государственного насилия, каким образом государство легитимирует насилие по отношению к обществу, каковы сложные взаимоотношения между государством и обществом как таковым. Большой акцент был сделан на войне, где насилие становится неизбежным и порождает очень серьезные последствия в общественной жизни. И сегодня у нас третья секция, которая посвящена обществу и насилию. Я приветствую всех участников, я очень признательна, что они согласились участвовать в банных чтениях. И также надеюсь, что наши слушатели и зрители в YouTube будут слушать и активно задавать вопросы. Напомню, что это уже сложившаяся традиция, когда после каждого доклада могут задаваться вопросы и будет, собственно, дискуссия. Я всех приветствую, передаю празды правления Татьяны Вайзер, которая сегодня будет модератором конференции. Дорогие коллеги, добрый день, мы очень рады вас приветствовать с нами и надеемся, что вы были с нами с самого начала конференции. Уже прошло два дня и две секции, сегодня у нас третий день банных чтений. И на этой секции мы поговорим о том, как происходит милитаризация российского общества, как исторически происходила радикализация политических форм насилия и попытаемся более четко определить категориальный аппарат, связанный с самим понятием насилия. Я прошу докладчиков держаться регламента, доклады длятся 20 минут и вопросы, реплики и дискуссии длится. Также 20 минут. Докладчики, пожалуйста, говорите. Speak as First of all, I would like to thank Irina Prohorova and her team at NLO for inviting me to the 27th Bathhouse readings. It is a great honor and pleasure for me to be here with you today, if only virtually, and to be able to present and discuss my research on the invention of terrorism in 19th century Europe. Russia and the United States with you. There is a standard narrative of the global history of terrorism prevalent in history as well as the social sciences. This narrative has been written by political scientists in the times of the Cold War. David C. Rappaport, for instance, in the 1970s and 80s, developed an influential theoretical approach to the history of terrorism. He argues that a religiously inspired pre-modern terrorism existed, and he cites the so-called Sicarii, the assassins, and the thugs as examples. Modern terrorism for Rappaport begins in 1878 in Russia and can be divided into four ideological waves, anarchist, anti-colonial, new left, and religious. This narrative of the antique forerunners of terrorism found in religious violence and tyrannicide, the origins of revolutionary terrorism in the terror of the French Revolution, and its evolution by way of the Narodnaya Volya in Tsarist Russia and anarchist individuals in Western Europe and the United States is today considered valid by the overwhelming portion of the current literature on terrorism and its history. In this literature, there is also basic consensus 
on classifying terrorism according to the categories of social, revolutionary, ethnic, nationalistic, and radically right wing. In the 1990s, religious terrorism was added as a fourth category. But is this standard narrative of the global history of terrorism actually true? Can it be corroborated by empirical historical research? This is the question I set out to solve. The answer is that the standard narrative of the global history of terrorism needs to be revised in crucial parts. So let me give you my a historian's story. In order to identify acts of terrorism in history, we need to know what we are looking for. This is why we first need to ask, what is terrorism and how does it function? According to the German sociologist Peter Waldmann's definition, terrorism is violence against a political order from below, which is planned and prepared and meant to be shocking. Such acts of violence are supposed to spread feelings of insecurity and intense fear, but they are also meant to generate sympathy and support. Weidmann stresses that for a terrorist act to be successful, the symbolic effect of the violence, its message, is more important than its instrumental effect, the destruction it causes. Terrorism is primarily a communication strategy, he writes. Most definitions by social and political scientists across the world agree with Waldmann's that terrorism is the use of spectacular symbolic violence with the primary aim of conveying a political message to target audiences and through their reactions affect political and social change. From today's perspective, the functioning of terrorism's social political logic may seem trivial enough. It was not trivial, however, for political actors in the 19th century to first comprehend and successfully exploit this logic. And this is why we can trace the learning process it took political actors to invent the tactic of terrorism. Terrorism was invented when spectacular violence was combined with mass media reporting to address a mass public. The process of this invention happened within a short period of time. It began in 1858 and was completed in 1866. But it spanned a fairly large geographical space, Europe, United States and Russia. Five men can be identified as the decisive inventors of terrorism. They participated in this process to different degrees. The first two were Felice Orsini, who tried to assassinate the French Emperor Napoleon III in Paris in 1858, and John Brown, who raided Harpers Ferry in 1859. They committed acts of violence, which firstly meet all the criteria for terrorism, and secondly, were the result of original thought and action, and not predominantly a copy of previous acts. Thirdly, their violent acts inspired others, namely Oscar Becker, who attacked the Prussian king, William I, in 1868, uh, 61, sorry, John Wilkes Booth, who shot the American president, Abraham Lincoln, in 1865, and Dmitry Vladimirovich Karakosov, who tried to kill the Russian Tsar Alexander II in 1866. The latter three are the first imitators for whom it has been possible to show that they directly or indirectly received the news of Orsini's and Brown's deeds, imitated them, and in doing so, develop the tactic further. Let me briefly introduce these gentlemen and their deeds. Curiously enough, the invention of terrorism began with the cooperation between an assassin and his intended victim. On January 14, 1858, 
the Italian nobleman Felice Orsini tried to kill the French emperor, Napoleon III. His attempt to kill Napoleon III differed from previous attacks in two respects. First, Orsini tried to outdo earlier assassins by staging an especially spectacular assassination. While most previous assassins had used knives and pistols, Orsini mainly relied on the latest weapon technology, grenades as large as Dutch cheese, originally developed in the Crimean War, which would detonate the very moment they hit the ground. Second, Felice Orsini did not intend to kill Napoleon III only in an instrumental fashion. Instead, Napoleon was to be a symbolic victim. Orsini and his co-conspirators co mainly intended to convey a political message to target audiences in order to affect political change. They believed that the assassination of Napoleon III would be a signal to the French people to start a revolution, which in turn would be a signal to Italians and other Europeans to start a revolution as well just as it had happened in 1830-31 and 1848-49. Moreover, according to Orsini, it was Napoleon III alone who blocked all progressive development, not just in the Italian states, but also in the whole of Europe. Once this obstacle was removed through Napoleon's assassination, Orsini believed it would trigger a chain reaction and open the path for the liberation of the whole of Europe. Thus, Orsini's plan to assassinate Napoleon III contains all the elements of terrorism as it is defined today. Significantly, Orsini's plan was only partial, partially realized initially. Only two aspects of this plan worked out immediately. First, the attempt to stage a spectacularly shocking assassination succeeded, although Napoleon III was not killed in the event. But even if the emperor escaped, Orsini's bombs wounded 156 people, eight or even 14 of whom ultimately died. This was the bloodiest terrorist act in the 19th century. Second, Orsini also succeeded to transform the national and international mass media into a sounding board, which enabled him to reach his target audiences. All over Europe and in Russia, the assassination attempt was immediately considered headline news, and within days, the public was informed about this violent act. Orsini and his co-conspirators failed politically, however because they were unable to convey a clear political message to their target audiences and through their reactions affect political change. If usual procedures had prevailed, Orsini's attempt would not have had any further political consequences. He and his co-conspirators would have been tried in court, condemned to death, executed, and that would have been the end of the story. In this case, however, events took a different turn, and as a result of this a transatlantic collective learning process of the invention of terrorism set in. The reason for this unlikely, unforeseen and unpredictable change of luck, from Orsini's perspective, was that Napoleon decided to cooperate with his would-be assassin. After the bloodbath in front of the Italian opera in Paris, politicians immediately started to hijack the event for their own purposes. Napoleon III especially began to plan a military intervention in order to affect the unification of Northern Italy. In order to gain the support of the public, he helped Orsini's trial to become a European media event in its own right. As Orsini expected to receive the death penalty, he could freely explain his deed and express his admiration for the principles of the French Revolution and for Napoleon I, whom his father had served. In this way, Orsini managed to make a positive impression on his audience in the courtroom. The French official newspaper published the court proceedings. This was unheard of. 
In this way, it successfully spread Orsini's political message to his target audiences all over Europe, including Russia, but with some exception for Austria-Hungary. The public explanation of Orsini's deed quickly produced visible results. When Orsini was executed in mid-March, many in France, the Italian states and the United Kingdom celebrated him as a martyr. After Orsini's death, Napoleon continued to pursue his new policies concerning the unification of Italy. In February 1861, after the Second War of Independence, as it came to be called, Italy was officially united under the rule of the Sardinian king. In this way, the French emperor crowned his assassin's failed attempt to kill him with public and political success. Orsini's main political objective, unification, was realized. Orsini's political effectiveness let the tactic he employed look attractive to others, searching for ways to reverse the social and or political order in their countries. The new means of transportation and communication, as well as the new media, enable these radicals to learn of the event and the political upheaval it caused. The news of Orsini's deed first reached North America on the paddle wheel steamer Canada, run by the Cunard Line. The boat left Liverpool on January 16, 1858 at 10.20 a.m., the first day of in-depth coverage of Orsini's deed, and it entered the port of Halifax in British North America, today is Canada, on January 28th at 4 a.m. Um, you can see the Arabia here, which left Liverpool a few days later with the decisive package then of the news on Orsini's attempt. American newspapers reported on Orsini's attempt to kill Napoleon III with as much interest and in as much detail as the European press. And the American public followed these events as closely as the one in Europe. Many so-called 48ers, revolutionaries exiled from Europe after 1849, as well as American born in the country, openly sympathized with Orsini, especially those that were also active in the abolitionist movement. One of the abolitionists who, in all likelihood, followed attentively the reporting on Orsini's assassination attempt and political and public reactions in Europe as well as in the United States was John Brown. It was the American abolitionist John Brown who first succeeded in assembling all parts of the tactic on of his own accord. He thus takes a central role in the process of the invention of terrorism. One of the first to point to the congruence of tactics was Abraham Lincoln, who sharply observed in February 1860 that Orsini's attempt on Louis Napoleon and John Brown's attempt at Harpers Ferry were, in their philosophy, precisely the same. On Sunday, October 16, 1859, John Brown set out together with some 20 volunteers to take in Harpers Ferry. This small town in Northern Virginia, now West Virginia, at the foot of the Blue Ridge Mountains, housed rifle factories and an arsenal of the US military. Attacking the only rifle factory and arsenal in the South would hit a war nerve given Southern fears, especially the fear that jo John Brown might use these weapons to arm a slave rebellion. Born in 1800, John Brown had fought for the abolition of slavery and helped slaves on their way to freedom all his life. Since the mid-1840s, he had conceived of a plan of how he wanted to bring about the abolition of slavery generally in the United States. Basically, this was an offensive version of the Underground Railroad, including guerrilla tactics. Right after the first detailed reports on Orsini's deeds and the political reactions it provoked had appeared in major US newspapers, 
Brown modified his long-cherished plan, however. The modified plan now incorporated the decisive elements of terrorist tactics the use of spectacular symbolic violence with the primary aim of conveying a political message to target audiences and to their reactions affect political and social change. Brown's procrastination in Harpers Ferry can be explained in this way. After the raid, Brown was extremely successful in spreading his message to target audiences in the northern and the southern states. And just as he had expected and most certainly learned from Orsini's example, his raid on Harpers Ferry further polarized and radicalized the American public at breathtaking speed. This radicalization and polarization of American society prepared the ground for secession, which led to the Civil War and to the abolition of slavery, a development entirely in correspondence with John Brown's analysis of the political situation and future developments. Just like Felicio Orsini and his, and his assassination attempt, John Brown and his raid on Harpers Ferry triggered political developments, which in the end led to a realization of his political objectives. And just as in Orsini's case, Brown and his raid became the focal point for a transatlantic media event in the United States, Europe and Russia. At least three radicals in Europe and the United States were inspired by Felice Orsini's and John Brown's effective use of the terrorist tactics for the achievement of their political aims and decided to imitate them. The contagion effect the influence of media exposure on the future behavior of other like-minded extremists is thus part of the story of terrorism right from the beginning. The first imitators for whom it has been possible to show that they received the news of Orsini's and Brown's deeds and acted upon their example were no more imitators, however, but they also developed the tactic further. First, they finalized it by inventing the genre of the Bekennerschreiben in German, written claim of responsibility, which would become typical for terrorism in the 19th and 20th centuries. And second, they universalized the tactic by using it for counter-revolutionary counter goals. With the development of the Bekennerschreiben and what is called right-wing terrorism, the invention of terrorism was complete. The first of the three imitators was Oskar Wilhelm Becker in Germany. Becker, born in Odessa to parents of German descent, was a law student at the University of Leipzig. After his attempt to assassinate the Prussian king, William I had failed, he explained to the examining court jury the terrorist tactics which he had tried to put into practice. And he asserted that his role model was Felice Orsini. Just as Orsini's assassination attempt had contributed to the unification of Italy, he had intended to contribute to the unification of Germany. According to the minutes of the interrogations, he already used the term to terrorize as a transitive verb similar to today's usage for the effect his violent act was supposed to have on the princes in the German states. His deed became the starting point for a European and, to some degree, also transatlantic media event. Still, it failed. One important reason for this failure was that the government and the public consciously tried to prevent the instrumentalization of Becker's assassination attempt by politicians and the media, and in this way avert the radicalization and polarization of the public in the German lands. In the United States, both Orsini and Brown served as a reference point for John Wilkes Booth, the second of the three imitators. When Lincoln, after the surrender of General Robert E. Lee, announced that he would confer the ballot on former slaves, at least on the very intelligent and on those who serve our cause as soldiers, Booth decided to kill the president, whom he deemed to be an illeg illegitimate office holder. The instrumental effect of the violence proved successful. Abraham Lincoln died from the wounds that he had received early in the next morning.
but the symbolic effect of the violence Booth had intended, its message was transmitted to his target audiences in a rudimentary fashion only. Booth expected that Confederates and their sympathizers would celebrate him for his deed, just, at, just like Orsini and Brown had been celebrated. But his high hopes came to naught. Southerners who held a more realistic judgment of the political situation extended the cold hand to him and his Bekennerschreiben to the editors of the Washington newspaper did not appear. The communication strategy failed and with it the intended act of terrorism. For the third imitator, Dmitry Vladimirovich Karakusov in Russia, there is evidence that Orsini, Brown and Booth all served as reference points. The way in which Karakusov received news of John Brown is especially interesting. The Russian revolutionary journalist and writer Nikolai Chernyshevsky was a close and sympathetic and well-informed observer of the democratic experiment in the United States on which he regularly reported. When Chernyshevsky read the news on John Brown and his raid on Harper's Ferry in European and possibly also American newspapers, he was deeply impressed and reported on John Brown fairly extensively. After Chernyshevsky was put into prison, he still managed to write and publish a novel called What is to be Done? In this book, he modeled his hero, Rachmetov, the epitome of the new man on John Brown or rather on what he had read on John Brown. Rahmetov in turn became a role model for Karakorsov. Similar to Orsini, Karakorsov, through his attempt to assassinate Tsar Alexander II, tried to trigger a revolution, which would lead to real freedom, Nastayashaya Volya, a fair distribution of land and capital among the population, and democratic self-rule, not least in order to better the living conditions for the newly emancipated serfs in Russia. With their violent acts, the invention of the fundamental terrorist tactic was completed. This pertains to its socio-political logic, its functioning, as well as to the three political orientations, ethnic nationalist, social revolutionary, and radically right-wing. Thus, since 1866, the terrorist tactic has existed in the repertoire for violent political struggles. Later imitators only needed to adapt it to so societal and technical changes, as well as new developments in the field of the media. This outcome confirms some assumptions and interpretations which have been common in the historiography on terrorism so far, but modifies others. The outcome confirms that terrorism is a product of what is usually called modernity, but it places the emergence of the terrorist tactic in a new chronology, a new geography, and in different historical contexts. Regarding the chronology, terrorism emerged 20 years earlier than has generally been assumed. The tactic was invented in a transnational process starting in 1858, when Felice Orsini attempted to kill Napoleon III, and not in the years which are commonly found in the literature on the history of terrorism. 1878, when Vera Sasulic made her attempt on Trepov, or 1879, when Narod Nayavolia was founded. Orsini, Becker, Brown, Booth, and Karakosov precede and thus replace the anarchists and nihilists which up to now have been regarded as the inventors of terrorism by most historians. As far as the geography is concerned, the transnational invention of terrorism has to be situated mainly in the history of Western Europe and the United States instead of Russian history. It was in Western history and the United States that the transportation, communication and media revolutions were furthest advanced and social movements as well as revolutionary ideals and traditions were the most em eminent. Moreover, the invention of terrorism was a transnational process. By the middle of the 19th century, the revolutions in the field of transportation, communication and the media had forged a common communicative space between Europe, Russia and the United States 
And this communicative space is also the reason why Felice Orsini must be viewed not just within the context of West European, but also of American history, while John Brown is not only a part of American, but also of Russian history. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Carola, for your so, so founded historical research and su such histo historical detail is not a, to, a, to great knowledge of our audience. We should ask if anybody has a replica or commentary or participants or the viewers who are watching us in the YouTube can channel. Carola, thank you so much. It was a magnificent talk. It is very interesting. And you now Russia is not original anymore. And, I, for, and I'm glad about it that I'm not at least original. <laughs> or we are not the first ones to invent terrorism. But, but my question is not, not so much a question, a commentary. Terrorism is, was born it's, it's a birth of media, and we can see that, as you just I were very just in saying that that the message needs this, it is born as a message that needs being spread. But me, we can see how media are vulnerable; they cannot but tell about this event. Am I right in understanding that theoretically? Uh, th terrorism should be fought uh, by ignoring it if media is not writing about it. So what's the meaning of terrorism if nobody's talking about it? it it's not spread. So it, it, am I right in understanding that media are helpless before terrorism because they are uh, their essence is such because they have to write about it because it's a focal event. And therefore, the fight with terrorism becomes problematic. Um, yes, thank you very much for this question, uh, which is very important, um, I think. Yes, it's true that um, media cannot not report on terrorism because um, the events are too important to a very large um, part of the population. The population is vulnerable, so it does want to know about these uh, events. Um, and this is why it is very difficult to deal with the terrorism. It's, it's a difficult um, uh, um, genre of violence to be dealt with. It's a difficult tactic for the media to, be dealt, to, to deal with it. But still there are differences in how the media can deal with terrorism. And I would argue that these differences in how terrorism is reported on make all the difference. Um, you can report on terrorism in a very factual manner, um, uh, trying to explain, trying to um, yeah, be very um, um, fact orientated. Um, and in this way, report on it. Uh, and not um, yeah, leave the public out of what happening, but not instrumentalize it and not enlarge it in any way. And um, I think it's, it's uh, for example, <laughs> history is, is good here because you can actually show the difference and you can actually see the difference um, and how it worked out historically. You can use history as an experiment and, and watch the difference. Um, and the example of John Brown is, is very educating here, I think, because in the very beginning, the media did report on the, on this raid on Harper's Ferry, but it reported in a way, and the same with Orsini, by the way, they, uh, the media reported in a way which did not uh, enlarge the violence, uh, which, um, um, yeah, basically, or, or very, very strictly said that this violence was not good, it, it was not helpful, it didn't lead anywhere. Um, and in this way, um, it didn't really 
um, make it attractive um, as an act to be repeated or yeah, um, kind of used in, in other parts of the world. And um, only after a couple of weeks, this changed. And um, the, the major difference in the reporting was that in the beginning, um, the media concentrated just on the instrumental violence. Yeah, and this is very clear to be seen for, for Harper's Ferry, where the media just kind of wondered what, what are these people doing? This is crazy, really. They can't win. Um, what, what's the purpose of this, really? Um, there are just people who are dead. There are people who are um, injured. So, so what is this for? And after a while, um, the symbolic meaning of the act was actually reported more and more. And this is when the polarization and the uh, radicalization of the public itself began, because it began then to identify with John Brown or really bedevil him. And this is, so, so there is, um, there are ways in which the media can report on terrorism without enlarging it. And there are other ways in which it definitely is uh, using it politically and enlarging it. And people at that time very much recognized the difference and were very alarmed about it. And that is also interesting because we have, we have, we are so used um, to to political uh, to acts of terrorism being used politically, um, that for those people it was much easier to see the difference than maybe it is for us now. Uh, yeah, you know, uh, of course I understand. First of all, nowadays we have internet, so mm -hmm. which does not simplify the situation yeah. in a. But really, I remembered how the archaeologists uh, implored the media not yeah. to mention that Palmyra is kind of under UNESCO uh, protection yeah. uh, because, yeah. because uh, it creates a political issue. But yes. somehow every type of media just was very furious <laughs> and saying this, this is a great monument. So, and it gave a further impetus to... Uh, to terrorists in a way. So yes. I'm afraid that in this way, somehow this is um, Achilles heel, you know, of the media. They can't find the remedy, uh, either not to mention at all or how to mention. Still, there is no receipt, I'm afraid. Uh, sorry, yeah. but uh, I see that uh, Hans Ulle Gumbrecht is wishing, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> didn't want to interfere. Oh, thank you. To do you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. no, no, and I wanted to say to Tatiana, I, I don't get the translation. I mean, because it's not very important because so far it's been all in English. But uh, okay, so um, maybe I, I continue with uh, an implication of Irina's question. I try to be relatively compact. But first of all, congratulations, uh, Carola. I think this was, uh, I had never really thought about terrorism in this historical way you think about the concept but i think this was a, a very convincing genealogy i would say the key implication was you need two things for terrorism to to emerge i mean one thing is of course media i mean this is the typical german answer also because everything the answer to every question in german is always media at least in the humanities uh, and then of course you need a public sphere and i would add and this is really my question you need a passionate public sphere. You know, if you have a public sphere that's tired, it will not work. And this is now my real question, and it's not meant to be a provocative question, but it's a question to you. And I think it, it was an implication of what Irina was talking about. Could one say that perhaps today, at least in certain regions, so and I would include into that region the European Union and uh, let's say post-Trump United States, um, we have maybe arrived um, at uh, the end of this genealogy of terrorism for two reasons. Uh, Irina, in a different context, already mentioned one, and one is the internet. Let's say you do no longer have uh, what you call light median, for example, in Germany, right? I mean, when I was a teenager in Germany, you had to watch the Target show at eight o'clock and everybody watched that. That does no longer exist. So um, you can no longer be sure uh, that uh, what you did gets covered in a central way. And then secondly, um, 
And that would also be an arc that started in the time you focus upon mid 19th century. If you say that mid 19th century in Europe and America and in Russia in a way was the time where these um, already existing or emerging public sphere was charged with passion that we have come to an end of that. I mean, it is like, uh, you know, you can see that in participation in elections, for example. I mean, less and less people go to elections. Uh, politics in the media is less and less central. So um, you cannot, and I mean, you could also add that um, statehood has gotten much better in controlling media altogether. My real question to you, I mean, I want to get your reaction to that is, could one say that we are now beginning to be at the end of the genealogy whose origin you so precisely reconstructed? Um, thank you very much for this question also. It's, um, you are completely correct, and, and in the book I elaborate on that a little further, that what one also needs is um, the political subject. Mm -hmm. um, people who take part in politics, who think politically, um, and for whom politi politics are important and who actually follow the media. And this is something created through the revolutions in the United States as well as in Europe. And um, the spread of media, the, the lowering of prices. So the penny press is really mm -hmm. crucial in this because this is the first time um, not only rich people can afford a newspaper, but everybody can buy it on the streets, in the streets um, for a penny if kind of it's interesting enough and so news gets more interesting <laughs> in a way um, takes up violence um, yeah violence is food for these this type of newspaper but also it's it's a fundamental precondition for for the existing on and for terrorism to come um, uh, to be invented and the political subject is as well and I, I think one can also show that um, kind of a, 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 um, a continuous, flow of media reporting is also very important and so speed comes in here mm -hmm. because only if you get news on a regular basis um, you will be so excited or excited enough to um, to really take part as an audience in terrorism and all of this comes together as one can or as I think I could show um, in the 1830s to 1850s and is kind of yeah prepared in the 1850s, yeah, through the telegraph and, and these inventions, mm -hmm. um, so that you got this media sphere, you got these political subjects who take part, and um, yes, so this can be described fairly clearly. Now, your question, uh, very, interesting, very interestingly, um, addresses our time, and the question, how did the media world and the political world really change um, in order to affect this, this logic. And I think there are a couple of things to keep in mind here. I don't have a ready-made answer for this. I, I, it's, it's a large question. But one thing I think is, one thing that's crucial is indeed the internet, as Irina Pokhova also has um, put forward already, not least because the internet makes it possible for terrorist groups um, in a very easy way to convey their own news um, and their stories about their terrorist acts. So while, as you mentioned, for, for the longest time in the 20th century, you had kind of gatekeepers for news who would select news um, for publication, either in print or radio, on radio or on television, um, this has been lost by the internet because groups like Daesh can just um, stream their own um, videos of the headings and terrorist acts into the internet right away. So what happens if this, yeah, what, what can we observe with this development? We can observe that there are, that there is no broad public anymore, which will actually um, receive these news um, in the same way. There are, there are specific groups which actually go to these pages and watch these news and let themselves affect by it. Um, there are the major news outlets which will 
also new use these videos, but show them only in in um, censored ways, really, by yeah, um, taking care of of um, 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 yeah, putting um, not not really showing the beheading itself or or protecting the people who are beheaded in in the visual images, and in this way adhere to ethical standards, um, and. And so, in a way, the society is breaking up in, in the way it's, it's uh, absorbing um, such news. So there are more possibilities to really uh, get the news out in, in the way terrorists want, on the one hand. And on the other hand, um, yeah, the audience is split. Um, but this also is affecting the ways, um, yeah, the, these news are then... Uh, further, uh, yeah, further affect political action and political um, developments in societies. And the other question is, is the political subject still um, alive in the way it developed in the 19th century? Um, and that is a very large and interesting question also to which I am not sure if I do have an answer, but I also have, my intuition would be that we we can observe other differentiations in society that there are uh, the so-called elites, yeah, which uh, other groups in society are not very fond of. They are still political subjects. They still follow news. They um, yeah, and and there are other groups um, who more and more get lost in this process. And, and we become their yeah, influencers. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And how to cope with this is, I don't think it's an easy situation and, and something that for democracy um, is vital that we that we solve these problems, yes, and address them. Thank Absolutely. you. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Thank you, Carola. Johanna Schwarz has the question. So, Carola, thank you very much for your very interesting talk. I think it's very important to see the history of um, terrorism as a and to analyze the, the the change of aims and targets and also the techniques and how it works. And my question is uh, about the same that has already been asked. Um, um, how has terrorism changed now in the 20th century and the 21st century? We have already talked about the importance of internet, of media, but another question would be, um, how have the targets um, been changed in this uh, time of period? So um, the um, case studies you had from the beginning of terrorism, that was always the target was the top of the state, like the king mm -hmm. or the... the um, a star or something like this. And in West Germany, for example, if we look at the German Red Army fraction, it's still the same. They they uh, try to kill the top of the state. They say it's not only uh, not anymore the Bundeskanzler, but it's the um, uh, a big uh, businessman or the sh a chef of a bank or something like this. They also kill only the top of the society, uh, economic top. And now... Um, hasn't uh, the targets of terrorism changed? I mean, if we look at 9-11, it doesn't matter who is being killed. The target is, okay, it's still, uh, uh, yes, the headquarter of the bank system, if you want, uh, but um, the people, um, it's not, it doesn't matter anymore how many people die in this these acts of terror. Or if you look on Hamas on uh, Israel now nowadays, they they the target is doesn't matter who is being killed. It's just you you try to target a city like Tel Aviv or something. So that's my question: How has um, the targets of terrorism changed over time until today? So what what uh, what historical development would you see there? Um, yeah, first of all, hi, Johannes, nice to see you <laughs> in this way. Um, thank you for this question also. Um, it, it also is, is a large question. And you're right that in the beginning, it was mostly heads of state um, that were targeted. Um, and at that time, it was, uh, although there are certainly exceptions, I mean, uh, John Brown's raid on Harpers Ferry would be such an exception, and, and there are others. Um, but... Um, 
there is a development overall which can be explained by a couple of factors. One factor is that heads of stain are um, much better protected after a while. Yeah, so we are starting out in a time when um, people like Abraham Lincoln or um, yeah, the, the, the Prussian king would walk around in parks and not be protected. Or Alexander II just walked around Petersburg with his dog. I mean, that was it. They would not have any police, nobody there. And this was well known to everybody in the population, they weren't protected. And it was part of the honor of a king not to be protected because you were loved by your people and you didn't need protection. So that was the logic behind that. And this changed with attacks. So with more attacks, uh, kings and, and heads of state needed more protection and received more protection, even though this was very, um, they didn't like that for a long time. And uh, the Prussian king and emperor then, William I, he, he kind of didn't want any protection until the end of his life. And he had several attacks on his life and still he didn't want any protection. I mean, it was just a question of honor, really. And, um, and the same can be, can be seen for, for others. Um, and, towards, and then the kind of the, the aims and the targets of uh, terrorism, they change a lot with the ideology. Yes, so already with the anarchists, you would get um, attacks on cafes, for example, or the Bologna opera. So and anybody who was sitting in a cafe, uh, which was just considered to be bourgeois, would be attacked and it didn't matter who that was or everybody who was in the opera um, and who would be considered bourgeois would be attacked. So with changes in ideology, the targets change, which is kind of um, understandable and with opportunity also. So while kings and, and heads of state were more protected, um, the general population became um, came more into view for terrorists because it was easy, a, a soft target simply. And um, still heads of state would be killed yeah, as, um, as long into the 20th century and certain groups like um, the RIF would still kind of um, yeah, attempt to um, attack especially uh, heads of state. But for example, right wing groups would mostly always attack rather weak parts in society, yeah, um, because it's it's part of their ideology that uh, that they want to um, make these people feel unsafe or um, drive out of a town or village or part uh, of a town or something like that. Um, and uh, so so there is a close link. Um, 9-11 is, uh, to a certain extent, an exception because an exceptionally high number of people died. Um, there are very few attempts with a similar death rate, really. Um, and yeah, target, the target was the, the symbol of the World Trade Center and the Pentagon and uh, probably the White House or the Congress uh, of the fourth plane, which came down um, in Pennsylvania or was brought down by the passengers in, in Pennsylvania. Um, so, so there the symbolic value was really, uh, yeah, the decisive point. And um, with other attacks, one always has to kind of look at the ideology, look at the aims, look at the possibilities also, or the difficulties to, to attack certain uh, targets um, to be able to understand why targets are, um, yeah, certain targets are, are chosen. And um, same with the Mohammed um, caricatures, for example, and the attack on Charlie Hebdo in Paris, or yeah, there's there usually is a close link with the ideology, which explains the targets. I just one last remark. Mm -hmm. I think it's also while dealing with the change of political regimes in the democratic countries, the elected president is not such a set. Uh, um, I know such a, uh, a sacred figure as emperor in a way. Uh, so okay, so it's awful if say a president is killed, but another will come with mm -hmm. election 
So this, the tactics is changing. So that, uh, so the terrorists are trying to find some symbolic objects like World Trade Center, which is episode mm -hmm. of, you know, American way of life. Or for instance, um, that was a horrible um, terror attack at the theater uh, in the early 2000s in, in Russia by the Chechen. But, and yeah. that was also a symbol of culture and entertainment yeah. and the way of life. I think that's very much uh, connected to, to the political situation. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Although I'm not quite sure if, um, I mean, there's this nice quote even by Narodnaya, people from Narodnaya Volia themselves who basically commented on their, when Alexander II was uh, killed in the end in 1881, uh, there was this comment, well, um, all we have achieved is that there is now a, a three instead of a two. So Alexander the third instead of Alexander the second. So uh, and and no change really in 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 the system. So for them also it was um, true, and they recognized it that somebody else would just follow up if not kind of the whole dynasty was was killed. So um, yes. <laughs> Thank you so much for the impulse for such an intense discussion. Dear colleagues, we are ending the discussion of the first speech. And